Our passage this morning is Mark chapter 4, 21 through 25. And in this passage, we see Jesus using the familiar parabolic illustration of a lamp under a bushel. But as we take a deeper look into the context and the original language of the text, we begin to see that Jesus' words are even more powerful than we see at first. But before we turn there, I'd like to cover some things that if you were in Sunday school, you've heard already. And uh, we talked about them on Wednesday night, and that's hermeneutics or biblical interpretation or how to read the Bible accurately. Um, And so we're just going to cover, just talk about that for just a few minutes, because this is one of those passages where we have to look at the surrounding context to really understand what's going on. Um, And so when we read the Bible, one of the things the Christian who loves God needs to be concerned with is accuracy. We need to be concerned with that. Not just understanding what from the Bible that we like, or, or finding an understanding that we take from the scripture that makes us feel good. We want accuracy, an accurate understanding of what the text actually says and means. And I cannot tell you how many times I've spoken with Christians who earnestly believe false teachings because they have not taken the time or have been, or have been taught to read the scripture in context. All communication happens in context. And the Bible is the most important communication that there is. And so we need to do our best to understand it correctly. Have you ever walked into a conversation when the two people are having a conversation, deep and intense conversation, maybe just maybe not so deep, but you just walk in and you hear a word or you hear what you think they're, they're talking about, but you really have no clue? It's taken out of context. We need to know what's going on in the conversation. And this, the, the Bible is all the more important. This is the word of God. This is communication with God. We better understand the context. We better understand what God is trying to say. It's not, we could come into that conversation and go, oh, they're talking about this. But if we're not involved in the conversation, if we don't know what's going on, our opinion on what they're talking about doesn't have any bearing on the truth. We have to be in context in communication. So when writing to Timothy about how to handle disagreements in the church, Paul says this in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Now that word, rightly handling, in the Greek is orthotomio, and it means accurately. It means accurately. Paul is exhorting Timothy to accurately handle the word of truth. And Paul is also connecting Timothy's accurate handling of the word of truth with Timothy's effort to present himself to God as an approved worker. So Paul makes it perfectly clear for us, God desires us to understand his word as he inspired it to be understood. We are in a time today, why do I bring this up? Because we are in a time today when many people, those who claim to be Christians and those and non-Christians alike, are using the Bible in quite the opposite way Paul encouraged Timothy. And instead of using the Bible the way Paul tells Timothy to accurately, instead of looking at God's word and seeing what God inspired it to mean, they are using the Bible as a tool to forward their own agendas. Nothing, and I mean absolutely nothing, should make us more concerned than to see God's word manipulated to forward any human agenda. We are God's people, and this is God's word. Regardless of who that agenda comes from, even if we align with that agenda personally, we ought ought not to support using the word of God in that way. We also need to recognize that all of us can fall into this error if we're not careful. Every single one of us can fall into this error if we're, not, if we're not careful. We bring so much of ourselves to the text of Scripture that it is often hard for us to really understand and receive what God is saying in the Word. We read a confusing passage or even a plain passage, and we add our own understanding or our own theological preference or our own cultural preference, our own bias to the text. We do that so much that we often alter the intended meaning of the text dramatically. 
Beloved, if we truly love God, the fact that we do this to his word, even unintentionally, ought to be of great concern to us. We ought to hate the idea of misreading a text because we want it to say something other than what it actually says. Because when we do that, we miss what God really has to say to us. We ought to long to get into the word of God. This book is not simply for experts to understand. It's for all the people of God to understand. And we ought to hunger for it. But we should also approach it with no small measure of reverence and care. Deuteronomy 4.12 says, Do not add to the word. We read a warning uh, to not take or add from the words of the book of Revelation in Revelation chapter 22. We see Paul exhort the Corinthians not to go beyond what is written in 1 Corinthians 4, 6. And each of those passages is bringing direction in different circumstances, but the lesson is is the same. Stick to, to what the word of God actually teaches. Just a quick side note. There's been this influx of teachers into the church that everybody's like, ooh, ah, over this teacher, because they're like, oh, what wonderful insight. I never would have thought of that before. If you ever are sitting under a teacher that constantly has insights that you never would have thought of before or that you wouldn't have gotten from reading the text, that should not make you excited. That should make you concerned. That should make you cautious. Because the word of God, the text, is most of the time pretty clear if we just read the context. So when you have a teacher constantly saying, oh, but check this new thing out, I want to urge you, dig deeper. We need to do the sometimes hard work of getting rid of the baggage of our preferred understanding or our love of clever insight and dig deeper into the context of the passage until we discover the inspired and intended meaning to the original audience. Here's the principle for us to understand. Write this in your Bibles, in your own words. I'm going to say it twice just so that you can remember it. Here's the principle. Any text of the Bible, any text of the Bible will never mean what it it was never inspired to mean. Any text of the Bible will never mean what it was never inspired to mean. It will never mean what it never meant. It will never mean what it never meant. We need to be willing to accept that because if we're not, if we insist on understanding any passage in our own preferred way and ignore the context, context, if we insist on reading into the word what we want to hear, then really what we want is not God. What we really want is our own affirmation, our own meaning. If we insist on reading the word of God in that way, what we really want then is simply us. This may seem like some heavy stuff to begin a message with. And the Lord continually lays this on my heart for myself and for his people. Why? Why does it matter so much that we accurately handle the word of truth? It matters because what God actually says in his word far outweighs any out-of-context or erroneous misunderstanding that we may have of any passage. No matter how lovely or encouraging we may find our misunderstanding, no matter how much our misuse of a text sticks it to our opponents, God's truth is always better. God's word, not ours, God's word is the lamp unto our feet and the light unto our path. And he wants that for his beloved people. He wants his word from his word for you. He does not want you to settle for your word. His word is way better. And that's worth rejoicing. And that's worth taking the difficult time to dig deeper. So I want to encourage you, dig deeper. Don't take, never, 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 never. Take my word for what you hear and say it's from God. You receive eagerly like the Bereans and and check the word to see if what I say is true. Amen? Amen. So, God's word is light. 
When we misuse it or refuse to read it in context, we hide that light under a bushel. He wants the light to shine. Which brings us to our text. Mark chapter 4, 21 through 25. And he said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he said to them, Pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. For the one who has, more will be taken. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Amen. Let's ask the Lord's blessing upon his word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the whole context of Mark chapter 4 and what it has to say to us. Lord, we thank you for our pastors. We thank you for our prophets. We thank you for our teachers. We thank you for all the people that you have gifted to serve the body. Father, we thank you for the gifts that you have poured out upon your people. And so, Father, we also, in that thankfulness, we want to receive today. We want to receive your word with eagerness, but we don't want to just stop there, Lord. We want to dig deeper and go further. Not just here, but in every moment, in every area of our lives, we want to go deeper and, and, and let your word have its way in us. So, Lord, we pray that today. Have, let your word have its way in us by the power of your spirit. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. So we continue today in the context of the parables of chapter 4 of Mark's gospel. Last week, Pastor John spoke on the parable of the soils, and next week, Nate will be speaking on the parable of the growing seed and the mustard seed. I'm a little angry with Nate for choosing that because I just did my thesis on on the parable of the the growing seed, and so he gave me a lot of extra work. Just kidding, Nate. (laughs) So um, what does the context of of chapter 4 teach us about this illustration that Jesus gives about the light, all right? Well, verses 21 through 25 immediately follow Christ's teaching his disciples about parables. So in this section, 21 and 25, we, it ought not to be thought of as a separate teaching, but rather as a continuation of what the Lord says in chapter 4, verse 10 through 12, or 10 to 20. So as you look in your Bibles, you'll see a whole bunch of different bold sections that say like that divide up each chapter you need to get rid of those in your mind most often those will just cause you to break up what you're reading when they're really not meant to be broken up all right so and this is one of those areas it's not meant to be broken up it's it's connected to what comes before it and what comes after so jesus has been speaking of the kingdom of god using illustrations that would have been familiar to the people and he explains to his disciples in verses 11 and 12 And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see, but not perceive, and may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. Now, translators have separated and quoted these words in your Bible because they are a paraphrase taken by Jesus from Isaiah 6. And Jesus tells his disciples, plainly that they will be given the secret of the kingdom of God. So notice the word secret here in verse 11. Notice it's not secrets. The Greek word is mysterion or mystery. And in this context, it is singular. Jesus is telling his disciples that the secret of the kingdom of God or the mystery of of the kingdom of God is for those who follow Jesus. So we need to note that. Put in our mental, in our mental notes here. We need to note that the Lord's words from verse 11, because they directly relate to our passage this morning. They're connected. They're contextual. We might ask, why would Jesus hide the meanings of his word from anyone? Well, why did he repeatedly tell those he healed not to speak of him? He had a timeline in mind a timeline that would lead him inevitably toward the cross. And everything he did pointed toward that final victory over sin and death. And he would purposefully shut the mouths of demons, and he would tell the 
healed to remain silent about him, and he would speak in parables, all so that he would not be hailed as political leader and would be, and would be able to fulfill his mission to the cross. Before you and I were ever made, Jesus loved us enough to secure the plan of salvation through Calvary before the foundation of the world. Christ purposely secured his way to Calvary, and the parables are just one way he did that. The rejection of Christ was a necessity that Christ secured through his actions and and his true teaching. He did so ultimately to offer salvation to the very ones who would crucify him. He didn't take one step away from the path to Calvary, not one step. He continually chose, continually chose to walk the road to Calvary. In verse 21, first verse of our passage, he said to them, Is a lamp brought to be put under a basket, under a bed, and not on a stand? Remember what we just saw about the word secret or mystery in in chapter 4, verse 11. It's singular. Scholar R.C. Sproul points out an important point about these words, the about the lamp here. The lamp here is not meant to represent just any lamp, not just an illustration, all right? Mark, unlike the other Gospels, is highlighting a specific point that Jesus is making about himself. And the words in the original Greek that Jesus is using here for the lamp, it is the definite article. According to R.C. Sproul in the Greek, it is not a lamp, it is the lamp. And the word brought in, in verse 21 should be better understood as comes. So R.C. Sproul says that that what Jesus is saying here is the lamp, the light, comes not to be hidden under a bushel. So remember, verse 11, the mystery is singular. And verse 21, the lamp is singular. Jesus isn't speaking just about any mystery, just about any light. Jesus calls his followers the light of the world in Matthew 5, 14. But in this context, in Mark chapter 4, 21, Jesus is using the definite article, the light. In John 8, 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of light. In this context then, and with the original language in mind, Jesus is here speaking of himself. So why does this all matter to our understanding of the text? Let's read on in verse 22. For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. The word light here at the end, um, come to light, is phaneros. And phaneros means made visible, except to be made visible. And so as we understand the mysterion of verse 11, as Jesus and his gospel laid down before the foundation of the world, and as we understand the Lord's use of the picture of light to represent himself, we see that Jesus is teaching his disciples this. He may be hidden now. He may be speaking in parables now. And some people may be confused about them. But he did not come to stay hidden. He did not come to be put under a bushel. He came to be made visible, to be made manifest. So the whole world will see him. This is connected to to what he just talked about. This is all one teaching. And Jesus says in verse 23, If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And so we come full circle to what we began with, that Jesus wants us to see him, to see him as he is, to have the ears to hear what he is saying. And he does not desire that any of us be so preoccupied with our own bias and opinions that we miss him. Jesus says this very phrase many times throughout the Gospels, and there's a lot of assumption that what Jesus is referring to whenever he says, let him who has ears to hear, let him hear, is some sort of special ability to understand God's word. That if you're so inclined to hear, or if you've been so enabled to hear, hear. And that may be included in the meaning of that phrase, but the literal understanding of the words are better understood as, if you have ears... Hear and understand. If you have ears, hear and understand. God wants all to see the light of the world. He offers that light to all mankind. Beloved, this is not just a message for past and present. Jesus is speaking into the future. 
We may dwell in a dark world now, but the light has been revealed. The light is shining, and the light will be seen by all. And everyone with ears will eventually hear. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So we need to understand the depth of what Christ is saying here. No one hides light. Jesus did not come ultimately to hide. Though he made some specific choices to secure Calvary, though he spoke in parables, he made it clear to his disciples he came to shine. One question we might ask ourselves is this. Am I hiding him? We need to ask ourselves, is my life, my attitude, what I say or do or post for the world to see, is it allowing the light of Christ to shine or am I putting Jesus under a bushel? Sometimes we love our bushels. They might be gilded bushels, but they're still bushels when they hide Christ. Does my life and my words portray an accurate picture of Jesus? Or is my agenda or my preference or my sin getting in the way? Beloved, God wants to make a people that when anyone who knows one of the people of God is asked, what is that person about? Even the non-Christian has one answer. Jesus. That's who he wants us to be. And we have to ask the tough question. If the people in my life who hear me, Christian and non, were to, ask, were to be asked that question, what is that person about? Would that be the answer? We, maybe we ought to ask, do I try to hide him purposefully? Maybe I hide him because I want approval. And because those who are around me that I care about are accustomed to darkness and don't like the light. Beloved, I have to say that this is a reality in the world today. The cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Jesus is offensive. The only thing people should be offended by from us is the gospel. We refuse to be ashamed of the gospel. Paul said, I have become all things to all men in order to win some. What he means by that, I'll give you a working definition of what Paul means by that. I have become all things to all men in order to win some. In other words, the only thing that's offensive about Paul is the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's nothing in Paul that will divide him from any audience except Jesus. And so Paul can go to any audience, Christian, non-Jewish, Gentile, regardless. And he can... Let them know that they are loved and cared for and that they have a voice with him and that that he wants to embrace them and bring them into the family of God. That there's no walls of offense other than the gospel for which he is unashamed. That also has to be said of us. But we live in a world where light is shunned. Our lives ought to be lives of sacrificial love for the church and sacrificial love for the lost. And I want to tell you again, I've said this, and I keep on going off my notes, so I'm hoping not taking too long, but I've said this many times before, and I want to say it again, and I want it to stick in your mind. I want it to stick in your mind. I want it to find root in your heart. I want to find root and fruit in your life. And this is, the, this is, this is my warning, that if listening to any teacher, any preacher, any author, anyone, if listening to them makes you have more enmity in your heart towards the lost of the world, you need to break ties with that teacher, preacher, or author. You're not called to be an enemy to them. You're called to be the hope. They might see you as an enemy, but you are called to bring them the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what we're called to bring. And so if anything, any preacher, myself included, causes you to hate, causes you to feel enmity instead of a passion to reach the lost for, with the gospel of Jesus Christ, then something is very wrong. I've said that so many times, but I want it to take root in you. If we ever think that light 
is not caustic. I want you to, some, sun, some day when your spouse or your child is asleep in a dark room, just come up and turn the lights on. Just blare them. Open up the windows. See what happens. Even a true and loving gospel light, even the gospel light given in gentle, loving, caring ways, will be offensive. It will be offensive to some sensibilities, even sensibilities in the church. Whether that light comes from a word or a brother or sister in Christ, whether it comes from the preaching or a teaching, when the light is shown, even in the church, and it pierces through and touches an area of darkness in our lives, sometimes that stings. And then, but when that sting comes, we have the choice to shy away and turn that wounded area away from the light, or we have have the choice to expose and let that light have its way and work in us. The question is, what are we going to do? Are we going to allow the Lord access to every single part of us, even the hidden parts that we try to keep dark? Verse 24, and he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. Pay attention to what you hear. Jesus is saying exactly what we spoke of in the beginning of this message. This is the word of God. Hear it. Pay attention. Do the hard work of listening. Dig dig deeper. Go further. Let's not defend ourselves from the wonders of his word. Let's not fall back into our comfortable bias. No, we need to die to self so that we might live abundantly. Jesus says, with the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. Beloved, those who grow under biblical study are those who are determined to know God more. What measure are you, are you giving to your relationship with the Lord? Are you paying attention to what you hear? If we come to church to be entertained, what happens when we aren't? If we come to church to feel bolstered up, what happens when we aren't? You get out of this what you put in. What would happen if every person came to any fellowship with the attitude, I sure hope I'm entertained today. I sure hope I'm served today. I sure hope I feel loved. I sure hope I feel seen and appreciated. What would happen? I'll tell you, none of the people that come with that expectation get what they want. I've seen it time and time and time again. With the measure you use, it will be measured unto you. What you get is what you put in. If, on the other hand, you come expecting to serve, you come as a living sacrifice, if you truly put all your expectations for self aside and desire only to be used to meet the needs of others, then your own personal needs are going to be met. If we approach the word as living sacrifices, as those who have been crucified with Christ and who want nothing more than what he wants for us, we will receive all that we put in and even more. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. Still more. As you put self aside and pay attention to what God's word has for you, you will receive over and above, in boundless measure, far more than you put in. As you serve the body, still more will be added unto you. Matthew 19, verse 27 through 29. Then Peter said in reply, See, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sister or mother or father or children or lands, for my name's sake, will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. For to the one who has, verse 25, more will be given And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Again, we need to understand this final verse of the parable in context. Has what? Has what in the context? Light. The truth of the statement is seen when we think about his return. If we have Jesus, even though we already have all things in Christ, more and more will be given until we walk in the fullness of our co-royalty with Christ. But to those who refuse the light of Christ... Even the little light they have, even that will be ultimately 
lost. For in that final day, as today, there is no light except Jesus, that which God gives us. And in that final day, if one has chosen darkness, they will receive it in full. Beloved, this can also be seen in the progress or digression of the Christian life. For if we desire Christ in all things, if we truly want his lordship and not our own, we will see his kingdom progress in our lives, in our homes, in our churches, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces. If we have and truly desire the light of Christ, we will be given more. Beloved, I am convinced that part of the reason our country is the way it is, the reason of the state of the world, the reason of the state of the church around the world, the reason why it is how it is, is because the church has forgotten the gospel. We have forgotten the call to which that God has placed on our lives. We have forgotten that we are not to be chasing our own agendas, to be chasing our hopes and our dreams and to build bigger barns and to win our causes. Our cause is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we have put that on the back burner for a whole bunch of other worldly things that are only going to last 50 years and, and neglected that which is going to last eternity. But if that had been our goal, the world would be different today. I'm convinced. I want you to recall the parable of the talents. The servant with the five talents who lived for the master and used his talents, his master's money to gain more for the master is given even more. But the servant who does not trust the master and takes the one talent they are given and hides it away, who buries that talent in darkness, even that talent is taken away from him and given to the one who's faithful to his master. Beloved, I don't know where you are today in your walk with Jesus. I know some of you are shining his light so brightly it's hard to miss. But some of us have bushels in our lives, some things that are hiding his light. And I want to say that is a double tragedy. It's a tragedy because when we hide his light by our bushels, the world gets the wrong impression of who he is. But it's not just the world that's deprived of his light when we, chose, when we choose to cover it. When we hide his light, we hide it from ourselves as well. Jesus came to be revealed. Revealed for who he really is. And he is Lord. And he desires to be Lord in our lives. Let the word of God speak for God. Let it speak for God to you. And in you. And through you. And for you. Let the word of God speak for God. When we allow the truth to have its way in us and through us, we will walk in true freedom and bring true freedom everywhere we go. Because our lives will be the very message of the word of God lived out. Beloved, what we're talking about today and what Jesus is talking about here is victory. Victory isn't found in all of our concerns. Little or big, victory isn't found when we win our worldly cause because that cause is going to end. God wants a victory for you that is seen in every aspect of who you are, in every aspect of your life, in every relationship that you deal with, in every struggle that you face, in every hardship that you feel, in every sickness, in every disease, in every sorrow, in every pain, and every time you've been forgotten, every time you've been left aside, every time you've been wounded, God has victory for you in the midst of that. He is, you are never meant as a child of God to stay in defeat, to stay under that bushel, to stay in darkness. He came to shine in your light, in your life. He came to shine in you. And I know that many of us here today, we don't feel that. We don't know it. And if that's for you today, if that's where you are, I don't know it. I don't feel it. I'm overwhelmed. Man, God has God for you today. He has himself for you. That's what you need. You might think you need a whole plethora of other things. I need the world to fall in line. I need things to go back the way they were when I was comfortable. That's not what you need. You need Jesus, 
in every aspect of who you are. You might think you need a moral world, but you don't. You have all you need in the Jesus Christ who came and died and rose again. That's what you need. And when you have Jesus, you have all. For we have all things in Christ. There is nothing that compares to him. And that's what he has for you today. So I want to say that if you don't have it, the question really is why? Because it is being held out for you. So before you leave today, I challenge you, receive it. Beloved, I, I remember been some difficult Mother's Days in our, in our lives. And, you know, Dawn is going on five years now from being diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer, stage four. And so that first Mother's Day after that wasn't so easy. But we believe she was healed. <laughs> and there's more, more to that story than, than just that, but I, I won't go into that right now. But we are trusting in, in, in God's plan for her. And I want to just tell you that even though that was the most difficult time of our lives, that what got us through is exactly what I'm talking about today. It wasn't the comfort or the comforting words that someone gave us that got us through. It wasn't some hope in medical science that got us through. What got us through was the presence of God in our lives. And I want to tell you that I've never felt closer to him in my life than than these five years. What we need is Jesus. And he wants to shine in you and through you and for you and to you. Amen. Go into the world and shine his light. Amen.